Back in Titus chapter 1 this afternoon, we've looked at the instruction of the Apostle Paul to Titus about what kind of men to appoint as elders in every city on the great island of Crete. They are to be men who demonstrate by their character a level of success at living the Christian life so that they are above reproach. That qualification of life is to be accompanied by a qualification of ability that is grounded in a mature faith. In verse 9, the man must hold fast to the faithful word. He is to possess a strength in orthodoxy. And being faithful to the word, he is then to be able to exhort or to teach sound doctrine. There is a leadership component of eldership that is responsible for leading the church in what to believe about God as revealed in his word. Paul tells us that elders are not only models of Christian living, but are also leaders in delivering the sound doctrine to their people. But there is a second ability that elders are to have when it comes to their role as under shepherds of Christ And that is, they are to be able to refute those who contradict. Look at uh, verse 9. Holding fast the faithful word, which is in accordance with the teaching, so that we will be able both to exhort in sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. Elders are to go on offense by teaching sound doctrine. And they are to play defense by fighting off false doctrine. I've attacked this notion before, but I'll drill it into you now once again. We cannot be simply known for what we are for. We must also be known for what we are against. We must also be known for what we are against. We are against those who contradict sound doctrine. We oppose false teaching. We contradict the words of unfaithful men. For the role of the elder, one of the primary purposes for elders needing to be established on the island of Crete, again it has been said of Crete that it's an island of a hundred cities. Titus was commissioned by Paul to appoint elders, and one of the major elements for appointing an elder is that they might defend the flock from false teaching. So then, Paul picks up on this last pastoral ability in verse 9, being able to contradict those who oppose sound doctrine. And in verses 10 through 16, he expounds on why elders are needed for such a role. Okay, let's go ahead and read the text together. Verses, we'll read down um, verses 10 through, uh, oh, well, um, that's right, it helps, I'm not looking at the right text. 10 through 16, I had it right and I looked down, I was looking over at 2 Timothy. Titus chapter 1, verses 10 through 16. For there are many rebellious men, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, who must be silenced because they are upsetting whole families, teaching things they should not teach for the sake of sordid gain. One of themselves, a prophet of their own, said, quote, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons, end quote. This testimony is true. For this reason... Reprove them severely so that they may be sound in the faith, not paying attention to Jewish myths and commandments of men who turn away from the truth. To the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, but both their mind and their conscience are defiled. They profess to know God, but by their deeds they deny him, being detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. We looked previously at verses 10 through 13 in brief last time. Pastors need to be appointed in churches because there are many rebellious men. That's what he says. For there are many rebellious men. Pastors generally... Don't face off against one threat to the body. 
It is not unusual to face many rebellious, empty talkers, many deceivers who cause lots of trouble. These are people who Paul describes as upsetting whole families with their teaching. There are people who aren't looking to be led by their pastors. They, the very definition of rebellion is that it is a lack of submissiveness. They do not respect, they do not love, and they do not follow their shepherds. They are hard-headed, prideful rebels against God's order, His Word, and His design for the church. So they seek to have influence among the other sheep in order to divide them and move them away from the message and mission of the chief shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ. So elders are needed because of the tendency of sheep, especially when there are wolves among them, to be scattered and to put themselves into harm's way. Paul is urging Titus to find men who are able to keep the sheep together in the ways of orthodox belief. In Matthew 9, verse 36, it says that Jesus felt compassion for the people because they were like sheep without a shepherd as they were distressed and dispirited, also could be translated harassed and thrown down. Shepherds are important because when sheep don't have them, the sheep are harassed, distressed, scattered, dispirited, and thrown down. There are people that are rebellious to God and will attempt to be rebellious against the shepherds. And they need to be able to refute those who contradict. At the end of verse 10 it says, look at it with me, that those rebellious and empty talkers and deceivers are especially found among the what? Circumcision. Empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the legalist crowd. The legalists are especially bad at making a mess of the church. They are deniers of freedom. They want to bind the lives and the consciences of others to match their own sensibilities and traditions. They ultimately are seeking their own gain. They are seeking to justify themselves and they will feel a whole lot better about themselves if you are required to live like them. That's the legalist way. Then in verses 12 to 13, Paul says something that isn't very kind. He violated the Southern Baptist 11th commandment of thou shalt be nice. Okay? And what does he say? One of themselves, a prophet of their own, said, quote, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. Now, it is a statement, of course, of hyper, uh, hyperbole. Always. Whatever you hear, always. That's, all, that's always going to be a case of hyperbole, whether you mean it or not. But notice what Paul said about this statement in verse 13. This testimony is true. Right? This testimony is true. Paul was not impressed with the cultural results of Crete's educational system. This is the typical person that was coming out of this paganized culture. Liars. People who say that they are telling the truth, but who are actually seeking to deceive you. Liars usually just don't come out and tell you, hey, by the way, I'm going to tell you something that's not true. Right? A liar is proposing to speak the truth. But they're looking to deceive you. They want you to believe something that isn't true, though they either know it isn't true themselves, or they are deceived themselves into believing and promoting lies that they think are true. That's what liars are. And that's what liars do. 
And God hates lying tongues, Proverbs 6, 16, and 17, especially from those who claim to be speaking for God. Okay? Liars who take the Lord's name do so in vain. That's a commandment. But also when you're speaking things that are not true, as if they were coming from God, not let not many of you become teachers for you're held to a stricter judgment. Beware of saying things that are true in God's name that aren't, right? We have to be careful of that. And so God wants his people to believe and speak the truth. But liars promote anti-truth. They seek to silence truth tellers and they are rebellious against the truth. One commentator noted that Cretans, I like this part, this is a good part, that Cretans had such a reputation for being liars that they invented a Greek word on their behalf, Cretizo. It means to lie. That even, even their nationality became a... a slur of their character that they're liars it became their cultural identity you can't trust what Cretans tell you and I noted last week that this is not unique to the ancient island it's quickly becoming a characteristic of our own nation so that to Americanize may be good may be a good way to describe the practice of corrupting through lies but the statement also says that they are evil beasts. Now we noted this morning that Paul says he faced um, beasts in uh, wild beasts in Ephesus. But this is a statement also that isn't especially nice, right? Except that it's true. A third century BC author stated, quote, Cretans are thieves from way back. Pirates. They never think along legal lines. So not only do they not tell the truth, but Crete being an island likely had literal pirates who, of course, are known for their thievery. They acted like animals. And I imagine that this statement against their character was a description of how they treated other people generally with a special emphasis on their lack of respect for other people's things. I don't know about you, but I, I picture in my mind beasts that are happy to steal away the meal that another animal who had worked hard to make its kill and is enjoying its dinner, and here comes an evil beast to come and snatch away that hard-fought meal. Right? Isn't that the way beasts kind of work? They really don't have a great ethical, moral code. If there's meat around... You find, you find a way to get yours. They're just evil, selfish, and thieving animals. And the final description was that they were lazy gluttons. Now, I hope you get the sense of irony that I did in looking at this phrase. Lazy means they don't work or they're not reliable in their work which describes the way that they work or don't do their job, right? There's, there's people who have jobs, but they're really lazy at them. There's other people who are lazy who just don't work. Lazy people, or as the Old Testament likes to refer to them as sluggards, are people who are undisciplined. They don't plan. Go to the ant, you lazy person, you sluggard. You're not paying attention to the way even nature works. You're not preparing. Sluggards, lazy people don't prepare. They don't earn much because they don't do much. They prefer to relax instead of work. They enjoy being served far more than serving. But the irony is, they love to eat. A glutton is someone who has made an idol of food so that he eats for pleasure to the point of excess. Listen, 
Don't let anybody rob you of your joy and your freedom and your wealth. It is not gluttony to enjoy a meal, to eat a lot, to have a feast, to be very full, to love eating, cooking, or to enjoy the pleasure of good food. That is not a sin. Gluttony is when food becomes an idol so that excess is the norm, where food goes well beyond nourishment of the body, but it becomes something to be selfish about. Where you care more about food than you care about others. That's one of the reasons why we bring this up on occasion. That's one of the reasons why we help young men wait and not just be gluttons and attack the food line and empty it all out before everyone else gets there. It's an aid. But it is the excessive desire for food that often leads to withholding food and resources from others so that you can consume it upon yourself. It is an extreme demonstration of selfishness with food as the idol of the heart. It is the idolatry of something that God gave to be good for us, and we use it in an undisciplined, excessive, and selfish manner. So when you put these things together, you get people who tell lies in order that they may take advantage of others by evil. Because they don't want to work for themselves in order to indulge their own love of feeding themselves to excess. Tell me I didn't just describe leftist America. Our political leaders want to radically transform this country into Crete. And so these were the stereotypes of Cretans. And Paul says in verse 13, this testimony, this stereotype has not missed the mark. It means it's generally true. Sometimes being unkind is necessary. Why? Because it's true. Don't speak kindly of someone when it is untrue. Don't make the error of thinking that being nice is always required of you. Jesus confronted snakes by calling them vipers. Jesus confronted legalists by calling them whitewashed tombs. If it is true, saying something unkind may be valuable. However, don't be a jerk for selfish motives either. Don't be mean in order to serve yourself, in order to puff yourself up and look how free I am to be not always kind. But if the truth needs a barb, then in wisdom, say it. But notice, the job of description of the overseer in the middle of verse 13 says, for this reason, because of the testimony being true, for this reason, reprove them severely so that they may be sound in the faith. The ESV says, rebuke them sharply. Pastors must, at times, have sharp rebuke for people. This is the application at the end of verse 9, where he is, where the elder, the overseer, is to refute or to oppose those who contradict sound doctrine, sound teaching, which corresponds to living. The elders, at times, must come with a strong rebuke. Sometimes your pastor isn't always going to be nice. Sometimes your pastor needs to get into your kitchen, as it were. Christian teaching has practical implications for rebellious, empty talkers who deceive, who lie, who take advantage of others, who don't care to work hard, but who love to eat exceedingly well. These are the people who do harm to other people. These are the people who restrict your liberties in order that they might get an advantage for themselves. These are the people who lie about racism and inequality. These are the people who want you to pay more in order to pay for others who don't pay. Listen, there are two types of politics, economics and culture in this world. 
There is Christian, a Christian view of politics, economics, and culture, and there is a non-Christian view, and elders need to know, to teach, and protect the difference. Elders have to know, teach, and protect the difference. And the fact is that Paul was not concerned as much about the island as he was for the presence of those types of people in the church. He's not rebuking the Cretans out there. He's rebuking the Cretans in here. Who brought Crete into the life of the body. Those people are not sound in the faith and they need to receive a severe rebuke. But look at verse 14. They're not to be not paying attention to Jewish myths and commandments of men who turn away from the truth. On the island, Judaism and Cretanism had assimilated. They had come together. They had each other in common. What is a Jewish myth? One definition of a myth is a fanciful tale that is uh, in contrast to narrative that is grounded in facts. Okay? A fanciful tale that is in contrast to a narrative that is grounded in facts. Myths and facts are enemies. One commentator wrote, by Jewish myths, He would be referring to stories circulated by Jewish teachers or in Jewish circles that lacked credible basis in fact and that were distracting Christian congregants from doctrines they needed to affirm and live out. So myths and lies, even religious lies, found found themselves together in Crete. He continues, the commentator continues, quote, that Greeks and Romans themselves saw the folly and indeed danger of putting stock in fictional fantasies. How much truer this would be for Paul, who saw in the story of Jesus and its Old Testament uh, precursors the outworking of eternal redemption. The churches in Crete would be neutralized or tilt negatively if their members exchange the wholesome substance of Scripture and apostolic proclamation for the pottage of speculative fictions. Paul warned Timothy in the Ephesian setting from from 2 Timothy 4, verse 4, they will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. Apparently, Ephesus was also not immune to this tendency. Because I think this is also common among the world. This is not just Crete and Ephesus. In our modern context, elders have to defend the body of Christ against myths that are opposed to facts. Therefore, we have to be careful about conspiracy theories and other myths, such as myths about racism, privilege, inequality, and injustice. There are myths among them. And we have to be wise about what we think is coming in the future, but we must be careful that we are living in the real world, that God has made and following the life of truth that he has called us to. There's another ditch on the other side. Endless conspiracy theories about things that cannot be, true, cannot be proven or demonstrated. We need to be careful. We need to be wise. We need to, we need to be careful about how we walk into the future. But we need to be careful about what we read. We need to be careful about what we believe and how we communicate to others so that we are people who are known for the truth. We're not a people who are known by myths and by lies. And overseers, elders, pastors, shepherds are designed by God to help the body to know the difference. Specific to the Cretan context, Paul was also concerned about those who were, quote, paying attention to the commandments of men who turn away from the truth. Those people, Paul says, 
need to be severely rebuked. We are not to be people who give ourselves over to the commandments of men that turn away from the truth. We oppose the abuse of power that claims itself to be the standard of truth. I like commentator Robert Yarbrough's comments at this point. Listen to what he said. Quote, Paul is far from antinomian. He offers no commandment against commandments that are truly from God. But in Jesus' teaching, there is wariness regarding what humans make of divinely revealed mandates. Mark 7, verse 8, you have let go of the commandments of God and are holding on to human traditions. This tendency, in turn, has roots in the Old Testament. Isaiah 29, the Lord said, These people draw near me, they honor me with their lips, and you know the rest I am, while their heart is far from me, and in vain do they worship me, teaching human commands and teachings. Something analogous comes to the fore in Paul. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than of Christ. You'll recall when we were there back in Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. Listen, brothers and sisters, the commandments of men do not carry the same weight as the commandments of God. They don't have the same weight. We can respect the commandments of men, we should submit to the commandments of authorities. We'll just use one illustration. Don't run red lights, right? Don't run red lights. But do not hold the commandments of men at any level on par with the commandments of God. There may be also, perhaps if someone is about ready to give birth and you prefer for it not to be in the car, if it's safe to run the red light, don't hold the commandments of God at a level on par with God's authority. Whenever the commandments of men clash with the commandments, the teachings, and the truth of God's word, we oppose such commandments and we teach and we contradict and we oppose and we even strongly rebuke. We are to be people of the truth in the world God made and under the kingly authority of Jesus Christ, who is right now the King of kings and Lord of lords. Paul is saying, be very careful. You need to be one who reproves men severely that they may be sound in the faith if they are leading you into myths and teaching you the commandments of men to, which turn away from the truth. Elders, at that point, are to stand up and to oppose and even rebuke. Look now at verse 15. To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their mind and their conscience are defiled. This is an interesting verse. Paul is very sensitive to legalistic corruptions, isn't he? And it seems that so often the culprit are the Jews, and for Paul, he was very familiar with what that looked like. They worked from the outside in instead of the inside out. To the pure, that is the description of a genuine believer. Does it sound kind of strange to think of it that way? But he says, to the pure, all things are pure. And a person who is pure is pure in heart. I think that's what Paul is getting at here. And Jesus talked about that as being a description of a kingdom citizen. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And so for the believer, he is free in Christ from all of the Jewishness of the law. 
A believer is free in Christ from all of the Jewishness of the law. For him, the things that are forbidden under Jewish law are pure to him because his heart has been purified. All of the pictures, the ceremonies, the shadows, the food, circumcision, those things that made Israel a nation and pointed to their need for a Messiah, they were fulfilled in Christ. He is saying here that the pure in heart are not defiled by food or by a Jewish calendar. Okay? To the pure in heart, they are not defiled by food or a Jewish calendar. Jesus said, it isn't what goes into the man that defiles him, but what comes out of the man. This goes back to one of the things I pointed out last week. Paul reminds us and urges us that you were called to freedom, brethren. And again, brothers, act like free men. We are not to use our freedom for fleshly purposes, but we are free from the Jewishness of the law. To the, to the one who is pure in heart, all these things are pure. But to the legalist, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving, Paul describes him here as the defiled and unbelieving, to them nothing is pure. He is still bound in his mind and conscience to a law that is no longer in effect. He has been so satisfied in himself with regard to his own identity as a law keeper that when those laws are removed, he is still tied up in knots over regulations of don't touch and don't eat. And listen, Paul is clearly sympathetic to Jewish customs, and having been one his whole life, he even submitted to some of them when in their territory, as it were, in Jerusalem. But when it comes to the house of God, when it comes to the church, the Jews were not allowed to press upon others a legalistic tradition. If a person's conscience was bothered to not eat kosher, Paul clearly taught that their conscience was to be respected and you are to be gentle with another person's weak conscience. Paul cares very much for conscience. He references conscience probably more than any other author. It hadn't been for that other person, for that person with a, who was uncomfortable not eating kosher, their conscience had not been completely purified yet. But what Paul had no tolerance for was when they sought to corrupt others, teach others, and bind the consciences of others to match their own sensibilities. It is one thing to be free in Christ, but to prefer some traditions. For instance, there is nothing wrong with circumcision. We looked at that last week from Galatians. Circumcision is nothing. You can do it, or you cannot do it. Paul said in Galatians, it isn't anything. You may or you may not. It doesn't matter, but it becomes a matter when you believe and say it matters and you teach and demand that others do so in order to be in proper relationship with God. I related that last week to our modern context of vaccines. Vaccines are not an evil in themselves. You can get one, or you cannot get one. But when someone like, shall we say, the governor of New York, perhaps you had the uh, vomitous privilege of seeing and listening to her this week. When someone like that tells you that it is actually a good that comes from God and you must get it, and that you need to evangelize others into vaccine participation, Paul says of that kind of legalism in verse 16, they profess to know God, but by their deeds they deny Him. Literally, they profess to know God by works they deny. They compel law-keeping, do this to your body, or else you are not right with God or your neighbor. 
They take the route of legalism and say, you need to do what I want to do. Or what I think you ought to do. They despise freedom and they despise others who don't share the commitment to external righteousness. They're not pure in heart. At the end of verse 16, Paul calls these people again, not being nice at this point again. Just instead giving a truthful description of who they are, he says, they are detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. They are so concerned about defilement and purity and works that they are defiled, detestable, and worthless for the real good works. They're described earlier as those who upset whole households. They are rebellious. They pay attention to myths instead of truth. They are empty talkers. They are deceivers. And though they profess to know God, they press their legalism upon others and end up being worthless for the good works that God has actually called us to. This is not flattering. And what are the elders there for? That's why I titled the message Severe Reproof. Brothers and sisters, beware of a legalist heart within you. Beware of being a person who doesn't love others who are different than you on matters that are neither good nor evil themselves. Do not separate from people or beat others up for not submitting to your conscience. Now your pastor is here to strongly rebuke you if you do. Sometimes we think it's all out there, and I sure hope it is. But we have to watch ourselves. I'm not preaching to somebody else or nobody. We do have to watch our own hearts and take care and take stock of ourselves. That is what Paul is saying elders are for. Pastors are gifted to the church in order to refute those who contradict biblical teaching. And instead, the commandments of men are what they love. And may I urge you and caution you, if you find yourself in the position of receiving a, bru- a rebuke from your elders, please beware of fighting and resisting. But humble yourself, examine the scripture, and consider the leaders that God has given you. Beware of kicking against the ones who have been given to the body for its protection. And it is extremely important because I am preaching also to myself that I must be careful that I am leading and guiding and rebuking and reproving and correcting and opposing and all these things on the basis of Scripture for the right reasons, with the right motives. There is many fingers pointing back at me. That's why the Word, that's why Scripture is for all of us. We all have to do the checkup from the neck up at times. We need to examine our own minds, our own thinking, our own motivations, our own hearts, and we have to be wise in doing so. But this is what elders are meant to do. Paul takes it very seriously on how we are to be those who refute people who contradict. And so in these days, we have to be wise, we have to be careful. All these different matters that are coming before us, and there's many voices and many Christian voices, many people who have brought Crete into the church. And we have to be wise and careful that we don't allow that to happen. We want Jesus to be the one who exemplifies what the church is to do and to be. Would you pray with me? Our Father, these are weighty matters. There are many threats to the body. We know that The gates of hell will not prevail against your church. We know that you have already won the victory. We know that those who are in Christ cannot be snatched out of your hand. 
We know that your purposes will all come to pass. But that is also not an excuse for an approach to ministry, an approach to the Christian life and the interactions and beliefs of the church to grow lazy, apathetic, indifferent, to think that I'm okay, I've got everything all figured out, to be prideful. We pray that we would be faithful, careful, always reforming ourselves. We pray that we would be people who are grounded in the word. We pray that you would raise up from among us men who are above reproach in their lives and able to do these things. Having sound doctrine in themselves, they're able to teach and to refute. So we pray for humility for each of us. We pray for growth. We don't just sit back and wait for the coming of our Lord. We want to be pleasing to you now in all things. So help us to be faithful. Conform us into the image of your Son. And in these times of difficulty, we pray that we would live the Christian life in joy, unafraid, and actually loving and taking advantage of the times for which we have been born. To uphold the truth, to declare your worth, to live faithfully, to raise families, to love the church, to be a people who follow hard after our Savior. So protect us, we pray. We know that we need the Chief Shepherd's protection for our lampstand to, be, to remain. We pray, Lord, that our lampstand would never be removed because we don't leave our first love, because we hold on, hold fast to the truth, to the faithful word. Bless us, we pray, and may this week we be found in service and worship of you, and we pray it in Jesus' name.